Yeah. Uh, so good evening to Professor Marcelo Masto, and good morning to our Chinese audience, and welcome to our uh, conference, our lecture today. So we have uh, Professor Masto from um, York University, Canada, and maybe as you all know, Professor Masolo Masto is a professor of sociological theory at York University. He is also the founding director of the Laboratory for Alternative Theories. And he's acknowledged globally as one of the authors who had made significant contributions to the revival of Marx studies over the last decade. And his research interests also include socialist thought, the history of labor movement, and alternative social economic systems. Now, I mean, uh, Professor Marcelo Masto has this kind of personal website. You can easily find it when you Google it or when you buy to it. And Professor Marcelo's work has also been translated worldwide in 25 languages, which is very amazing. And among his publications, there are four single author books and 11 edited volumes, among which we can quote like uh, the last year of Karl Marx and uh, his book, Another Marx, which is published in 2018, I think in English, but also translated recently and published in Chinese by uh, Chinese Renmin University Press in 2012, yeah. And we ha have also uh, Dr. Assistant Professor Zhang Milan from Sun Yat-sen University, who will, uh, af at, yeah, after Professor Masto's talk, will share some ideas and have a kind of discussion with Professor Marcelo Masto. So shall we start? And please welcome uh, Professor Marcelo Masto to give his talk, whose topic is another Marx, new profiles of an evergreen. Well, um, thank you, everybody. Um, good morning to you already on uh, Saturday there in, uh, in uh, Shanghai or in other <clears throat> Chinese universities and here in Toronto. Uh, it's uh, Friday evening. It's a real pleasure for me to come back to um, Fudan University. Um, actually, my first visit to China um, back then in 2010 was also organized by the School of Philosophy and University of Fudan. And after that, I've been um, you know, coming back um, several times. So it's a pleasure for me to return. And actually, it's a um, particular pleasure to discuss and to be here with you with um, young scholars. And I'm extremely um, grateful to uh, Jean Milan for the organization of this event. And of course, also to Chulming Wang and Yifan Song for all the technical support and also for the general, generous words of introduction. So um, I have been given um, 60 minutes of time. So my presentation should last until uh, 10. And uh, what I'm trying to do today will be something uh, like um, providing some um, basic information about Marx for those who are not experts of these authors, but at the same time also introducing, trying to introduce some novelties about the publication of his writings, about the debates on Marx that are so relevant and let's say the more trendy today in the world around the globe. And then of course I will try to also introduce some of the topics that I have been um, debating and um, you know um, discussing in my in my writings. So another Marx just came out in China with China Renmin University Press, and then also the last years of Karl Marx uh, is um, forthcoming in press at the moment. I'm not sure, but it will be out very soon with the People's Publishing House. But I would like to start from this work from uh, another book that came out in 2020 and is called The Marx Revival, Key Concept and New Interpretation. I would like to start from the question of the Marx Revival because I've been also uh, observing, I'm sure with many of you, and this, is, this has been a topic of um, conversation, of debate with many Chinese scholars uh, with whom I've been uh, working um, cooperating and also with the many conferences, lectures and talks that I've given in China with you. So the new attention that has been given to Marx, particularly in the last 15 years, but uh, uh, even more, I will say, in the, in the last few years. So we have been starting to um, 
discuss about this and observe this phenomena in another book that the China Renmin University Press published, another book of mine, this one as an editor. The title of the book is Marx for Today, recently published with the China Renmin University Press. And in this book, we were observing the, among other things, let's say that the book was divided in, uh, in two uh, parts. In the first part, there were the new topics the new um, themes um, related to Marx research. And I will return to this later because I want to spend a significant portion of my uh, presentation with relation to the last years of Karl Marx and with relation to political writings of Marx. So I'm very interested in this and I will try to bring the discussion on this. In the second part of this book, Marx for Today, we were actually talking about the reception of Marx in the world from 2000 to 2010. So we were observing at the time, we were just talking about 10 languages, 10 main languages, Chinese was of course there. And we were observing a return to Marx, particularly as you might remember, after 2008, after the economic crisis. So Marx as interpreter of capitalism, even though in this book you can see in Marx for today, you can see that this return to Marx was anticipated in some other parts of the world, uh, particularly in Latin America, in South America for political reasons. So there is an attention to Marx for political reasons. And for those of you who are um, young, very young, or for the beginners, as I mentioned at the beginning, I must also perhaps do one step back and explain that I talk about a return to Marx because for at least 20 years, let's say from the middle of the 80s, from the fall of Berlin Wall in 1989, where the scholarship on Marx and also the publication of Marx himself is on books where almost, you know, um, um, they almost disappeared. They were very limited uh, publication, even in countries in languages like, you know, Italian, French, German, where uh, there was um, a significant scholarship in, uh, in Marx and Marxist studies, particularly in 1960s and 1970s. So for me, it's always interesting and fascinating to see also how China, as you know, um, jumped on this wave, on this new wave of um, interest for Marx, new interpretation for Marx, because there were <clears throat> an incredibly high number of translations of uh, you know interpretation of Marx, Marxist interpretations, Marxist studies that were translated into Chinese, particularly in uh, the last ten years, and also something that I'm very um, interested and active is to bring Chinese studies into English. So trying to translate uh, Chinese work and the Chinese scholarship in the two series that I direct, the two book series that I direct. One is called Marx Angus Marxism with Public Film Macmillan, and another one is called Critique and Alternative to Capitalism with Routledge. So a process of exchange of ideas. So if the return to Marx after 2008 was uh, primarily a return to the critique of political economy, because you might remember that um, Marx was, um, you know, republished even in conservative newspapers, even in conservative magazines, uh, liberal newspapers as a sort of anticipator of the economic crisis of 2008. We have been actually talking about uh, the parallel between the 1857 financial crisis, the first global crisis of capitalism that Marx observed very carefully as a correspondent of the New York Daily Tribune. Marx was a journalist, as I will tell you later, uh, for the most important newspaper in the United States and the crisis that started exactly 150 years after in 2007, in 2008 with the subprime in the United States. So there is a lot of interest in Marx and in this Marx um, interpretation of capitalism. And we can say, we can observe that Marx's books have uh, reappeared on bookshop shelves once again after a long time, after more than two decades. So this is a phenomenon that happened 
almost everywhere in the world, reprint of capital, reprint of books of Marx, this was very significant. In this period, uh, I would say almost in parallel to this period, there is another interesting uh, things that happened to Marx studies. And I would say that um, shaped like a revolution in Marx studies. And this is the new beginning, the restart of the Marx-Engels Gesamtausgabe. The Marx-Engels Gesamtausgabe is the new historical critical edition of the writings. And as I will tell you later, not only the writings, but also the manuscripts of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. This project had started in 1975 in Moscow, in Berlin, but actually it ended with uh, you know, the dissolution of Soviet Union. So starting from 1998, but significantly, I would say in the first decade of the new century, the publications of Marx and Engels started again. And between then and now, there are 24 new volumes of uh, uh, books of Marx and Engels. Some of them were republications of things that we already knew, sometimes in a new form, as I will tell you later, and some of them were new things, novelties. In particular, as I will explain now in relation to the studies made by Marx, previously unknown studies made by Marx. Well, I don't have to explain to many of you how this is important for all of us, because China is actually um, the most um, advanced country in order to translate the Marx-Engels Gesamtausgabe volumes into Chinese. So these 24 new volumes, many of them, some of them, a good portion of them have been uh, translated or are in process of being translated into Chinese in order to update this old dogmatic sometime um, interpretation of Marx through Moscow, right? Not sometimes translations directly from German and also, but, but from Russian or sometimes translation, I don't know, with the introduction of the Institute for Marxist-Leninism or Lenin, etc. So this new generation of readers of Marx is also encountering um, a, a significant interest in China and the Marx that we are reading, as I will try to argue later in details, is uh, um, a better Marx. Like, you know, we know more about Marx. We are more careful about um, the translation of his work. And this is something that is also happening in China. So the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe is divided in four sections. In the first section, we will see, we are going to, you know, um, reading and um, publishing um, the books published by Marx and Engels himself, their, themselves in their lives. Even though in some cases, like for the German ideology, like for the economical philosophical manuscript of 1844, there is actually a process of publishing in a new form um, manuscripts that were not books, but that actually were published as if they were books. The German ideology in particular was published like the Bible of historical materialism. But we know today that there are many problems in that, uh, in that edition, and we are reading this text in a different way. Um, the manuscripts of 1844, uh, please be careful, these two books, the German ideology and the EPM of 1844, the Economical Philosophical Manuscript of 1844, they are, as I will show you later, perhaps more known of many books that Marx published in his life. And more interesting at this um, beginning of my talk, I just want to mention that these are some of the most sold, printed and sold books of Karl Marx and also, um, you know, very influential. For example, when we talk about Marx in sociology, usually they take the part on division of labor that is um, included in the German ideology. Or when we talk about Marx philosophy, we usually read the Economical Philosophical Manuscript of 1844. So it is very interesting for us now to read these books, these uh, uh, manuscripts in another form that is more 
incomplete form, sometimes also fragmentary forms, as I will try to argue later, and to uh, understand that this is not the final point of Marx or of Marx and Engels on that particular issue. I will insist on this from two points of view, not only from the textual point of view, but also from the point of view that actually Marx developed these ideas much, much more. And there is an unbalanced relation between the young Marx and the writings that Marx did at the end of his life. But I will bring you there later in my talk. I have time, I have 60 minutes. So for the moment, I want to say there are four sections of the mega. The first time is the publication of books that he published by himself or that has been considered, have been considered like um, um, almost completed books by Marx and Engels. In the second part of the mega, there is Capital and its preparatory manuscripts, starting from 1857, starting from the Grundrisse. And uh, this is very important for us. My first book in Chinese was actually a book that was published on the 150th anniversary of the Grundrisse, uh, written by Marx between 1857 and 1858. And once again, we were studying the dissemination, the reception of the Grundrisse, including in China. And this was very interested and very interesting to uh, observe how sometimes uh, ideas of Marx from this text have changed the perception of some of his concepts, some of his categories. I will try to return this later. So in my presentation, I will start with more textual, philological information, and later I would like to go to more theoretical issues that I'm, of course, starting to introduce now. So when we think about capital, when I used to be uh, a young uh, university student and I used to read Capital, I learned that Capital is done in, is divided in three volumes, volume one, two, and three. And that volume two and three were not uh, finished by Marx, but they were edited by Friedrich Engels after Marx died. Today with the mega and with the second section of the mega, Capital is an incredible journey into the critique of political economy because we are talking about 15 different volumes. Starting from 1857, we are following Marx in all the many preparatory drafts of his masterpiece and not only of Capital Volume 1, but also Volume 2 and Volume 3 including the theories of surplus values in the early 60s, but also arriving to the last manuscript that Marx wrote at the end of his life um, in, in 1881. And very important, um, also following um, the translations of Capital Volume 1 in other languages. Because as you know, Capital was translated into Russian, Capital was translated into French, and actually my next book this year will be published in November is called Marx Le Capital. Le Capital is the French name for Capital, and we are talking about evaluation, history, and reception of this book because actually this translation is a translation to which Marx participated himself and he made several changes. And we are actually debating if Engels considered all the changes that were made in this edition. Um, so we are following Marx as I was trying to tell you in all the preparatory uh, stages of uh, uh, Capital and also after his publication, I want to make clear that Marx is no longer trying to continue uh, Capital Volume 2 and to finish, which he could not do for you know, the health issues that, uh, that he had, but also Marx is trying to improve Capital Volume 1, not only with the French translation published between 1872 and 1875 in 44 installments, but also with the new German edition of uh, Volume 1 made by Marx. Now I would like to go ahead and I would like to give you some information about the third section of the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe. That is a section in which we can finally read 
all the letters that Marx and Engels exchange, not only among them, Marx to Engels, Engels to Marx, but we can also see the letters that they received from other people. So we can finally have um, a broad perception of the making of Marx Engels ideas, or we can have a broad perception of the exchanges that Marx and Engels had. Just to give you an idea, they wrote 4,000 letters, but now we are reading 14,000 letters. There are 10,000 letters more. And imagine if you are a scholar of 1848, imagine if you are a scholar of the first international, like you can learn a lot from these documents. And you can also see how Marx and Engels were not gods on earth, but they were actually learning a lot in their political process. And they were learning a lot also um, 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 from the exchange with other militant, other activists and other thinkers, as I will also try to tell you later. And now I would like to um, bring, take uh, two more minutes to discuss the fourth and final section of the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe that is the most difficult to read, uh, the most complicated to translate, perhaps impossible, but the most interesting to study. Uh, that is um, the um, is made by the notebooks, by the two hundred notebooks that Marx wrote in his life starting from his university years in 1838 until the very end of his life in 1882. So in this period, Marx is actually doing something very interesting for us. That is reading books and also making photocopies of these books. But since the photocopy machine did not exist, Marx is actually copying, Marx is actually writing the most interesting parts of these books sometimes changing their order, sometimes making um, critical notes, sometimes writing, you know, sort of continuation of what he thought would have been interesting in these books. And you can understand that this for Marx scholars is a sort of, you know, incredible treasure because you can finally see not only the direction that Marx had taken in his studies. So you can see what were the books that Marx read and you can finally see, oh, this is the work that he was doing while he was writing this one. But particularly for the end of his life, as I will tell you at the end of my presentation, we can see the direction that Marx wanted to take, right? So we can see the kind of study that he was doing, the kind of critical comments, annotation that he was taking, and we can speculate about what Marx would have done had he had more time. And in my opinion, Marx was trying to, I'm gonna say this very quickly now, and later we, I will return on this, and we have also plenty of time to debate, Marx was expanding the analysis of capitalism. So he was expanding more and more and more, not only in terms of England and Europe, but he was also trying to get as many information from the United States, from Russia, and from what we call today the Global South. I will try to present some evidence of this later, particularly in relation to India, but not only to that. So these priceless materials, these volumes of the mega two of the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe, we call it two because the first project ended in 19, um, 91, they show what I call an another Marx, right? So it is very uh, interesting to see that the Marx that we can uh, read in this manuscript is very different, in some cases, truly very different from the kind of dogmatic Marx of the Marxism Leninism of the 20th century. Um, it is not a Marx that is only interested in uh, capital and labor. Capital and labor is, of course, uh, you know, a, an essential element of his analysis. Class struggle and, you know, work is uh, an essential uh, place for, for Marxist analysis. But don't believe to these people, to these new interpretations that are trying to represent Marx as uh, 
uh, a white male who was also only interested in, in labor and didn't know anything about race, about gender, about internationalism. This is not true at all, like this interpretation of Marx being an uh, Orientalist. So thanks to these documents, we can actually prove with more evidence what was clear before, that Marx had an incredible um, uh, you know, mind, a very brilliant mind, and his interest were um, um, many, uh, truly uh, incredible for a, a single brain. Like going back to the uh, notebooks of excerpts, so the notes that Marx was taking, I want to remind you that Marx has taken notes and made comments in eight languages from Greek and Latin, because Marx studied this when he was young at university. But then, of course, also beside German, in French, in English, in Italian, in Spanish, in Russian, also he could uh, read uh, Dutch. And even more interesting for us, even though Marx knew less languages than Engels, because Engels was able to manage 12 languages, so one third more than Marx. So this is inspiring for us, like as um, scholars, but also I want to tell you the disciplines of the interest of Marx so that you can understand that Marx is not only focused on political economy, even though, of course, and I underline, of course, the critique of political economy is the essential um, element for the critique of capitalism for Marx. So Marx made uh, notes and took excerpts from philosophy, art, history, uh, religion, politics, law, literature, history. There is a lot of history, international relations, technology. And then in the last 15 years of his life, there is a lot of mathematics, uh, physiology, geology, mineralogy, agronomy. And then in particular, interesting for me, for the last Marx, there is a lot of anthropology and ethnology together with chemistry and physics. Some of these studies, some of these disciplines were studied by Marx because of you know, the continuation of capital and because he wanted to understand many things, for example, about the rent and he needed to study, I don't know, uh, geology, agronomy, etc. But Marx was also a person interested in any new tendency of uh, uh, you know, the realm of knowledge. And like, for example, Marx wanted to know, wanted to know all the um, most recent discoveries about mathematics. And the last Marx is actually uh, doing at the end of his life a sort of new study and creating new um, interpretation in mathematics. He was very proud of this and was shared was sharing these things with with Engels. So, I was going to um, uh, stop now because I would like to take you uh, to a second uh, part of my presentation. Now that this um, um, discussion is, uh, uh, you know, a presentation about the new historical. Um, uh, documents that uh, we read of Marx is clear, but I also wanted to mention one final thing about the Marx revival and about the changes of the last years. So I said return to Marx, particularly interesting for the critique of political economy after a new crisis of capitalism, Marx is still considered the most relevant author and thinker in order to understand the tendencies of capitalism and provide us elements to critique and hopefully um, change capitalism and you know, overcome capitalism. And then I also mentioned in this first part of my talk, the novelties related to the Marx Engels Gesamthaus Gabe, and also the uncompleted, fragmentary, and sometimes also contradictory, and we should not fear about this. I will return to this later characteristic of Marx writings, because all the students who are listening now, they should understand that Marx was trying to write on so many topics, and he had so many projects that, of course, he could not complete all of them. And this is a characteristic of many classics. Max Weber is the same, Hegel is the same, et cetera, et cetera. I could make other examples. And, uh, I um, want to also um, uh, move forward now to the presentation of, uh, or the discussion about um, what are the readings, what are the writings of Marx that um, we um, 
can consider like Marx's final word. And what are the texts of Marx that sometimes we believe are a finished book by, by Marx, but actually they are not, right? So in order to do this, I would like to uh, show you and share with you a chart that I have prepared. But before doing this, I need uh, two or three minutes of your attention um, in order to discuss a little bit the intellectual biography of Marx which is a topic that is um, extremely relevant for me for a simple reason. We can really understand the manuscripts of Marx and we can really understand uh, how final or how uncompleted they were only if we know Marx's life and we are aware of the difficulties that Marx were having and uh, when he was writing these documents and at, this, at which stage where they left by Marx. So in order to do this, I want to explain that Marx was not the kind of political leader that sometimes we imagine today or that many people imagine in the 20th century. What I'm trying to say is that when we think about Karl Marx, we think about one of the most translated and read author of the entire history of humanity. And we think about, I don't know, the statue of Marx in uh, Beijing, in Shanghai, etc., and in many other parts of the world. And of course, we think about the 20th century where there were so many countries that in one way or another, being faithful to Marx or being truly unfaithful to Marx ideas, they were saying, you know, we have a Marxist ideology, we're embracing a Marx doctrine, okay? So if you think about this, you can imagine that Marx, when he was alive, had so many followers as he had later. This is actually wrong because, you know, there is, of course, a making of his ideas. And then there is, of course, a making of the dissemination of uh, his books. And in the case of Marx, it is also a political struggle. It is a political struggle against other socialism. For example, the state socialism of La Salle in Germany, Ferdinand La Salle, or the French socialism of Pierre Joseph Proudhon in France. And I could make many other examples. And for example, the fight with Mikhail Bakunin in the first international and his uh, anarchist ideas. So there is a slow process of Marx becoming the most brilliant author and the main reference in the labor move movement everywhere internationally all around the world. So I want to say that when Marx was uh, young in the 40s, he uh, was uh, exiled and he was a migrant and he was actually kicked out from one country to another, from Germany to France and then exposed to France um, in 1845. He arrived in Paris in 1843 after he realized that he could not be a university professor in Berlin and he could not be um, a journalist in Köln. Then he went to Brussels, but then after the 1848 revolution, he was kicked out from Belgium. He could return to uh, French where there was the revolution, but then after the revolution was defeated in 1849, Marx was forced to go in the only place where he could go. Perhaps the only alternative would have been to go to Switzerland or the United States, but he was very lucky to go to London because London had the best library of the world, the British Museum Library. And as we know, Marx spent many, many days in that place doing his research. So in the 1840s, Marx had a very troubled life. In the 1850s, Marx on the contrary was completely isolated. The counter revolution is winning everywhere. Marx has very little connections. And actually you can count on your two hands, you know, the contacts that he had. The good things that Marx did in this period is that instead of participating to this, um, you know, political group of refugees that we said, you know, they were arguing the revolution lost because we haven't organized the take of the power in a better way, in the best possible way, etc. Marx is actually starting to uh, prepare the critique of political economy. That as I told you before, it actually starts with the Grundrisse in 1857, the first draft, but actually before the Grundrisse, there is uh, one decade and a half of preparation. And I prepared a table, a chart for you. 
So this pe period of isolation, the 1850s, is ending actually when in the middle of the 60s, Marx became the most relevant political leader of the first international, of the International Working Men Association. This is very important for us. For eight years, from 1864 to 1872, Marx is the leader of the most important organization of the working class all over the world. And of course, this is going to be a lot of uh, um, um, relevance to Marx and his ideas are circulating a lot, particularly one text that is called The Civil War in France that you all should read because it is a, a very brilliant um, description of the uh, Paris Commune 1871. So in this period, Marx is called the Red Terror Doctor. And uh, of course, Marx is also doing Capital and continuing to uh, work on Capital. And there is the publication of Capital in 1867, uh, as I told you before. So after the end of the International, there is a sort of, in 1872, there is a sort of dark period in the life of Marx. Dark in the, in the sense that it was not clear that many scholars did not understand what happened to Marx between 1872 and 1883. And this is why I've been writing in the past years uh, 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 as much as possible on this topic. And I have recently published the last years of Karl Marx that is going to be published now also in uh, Chinese by People's Publishing House. And I've done a lot of work on the intellectual biography of Marx, because as I will try to explain later, Marx has done a lot in the last decade of his life. And actually what Marx has done in the last decade of his life is perhaps the most relevant things for us today, because the topic that he has been working on in the last 10, 15 years of his life are the most relevant political issues that we are debating today in our world. So I'm talking about a return to the late Marx as a return to the political Marx, so that we are not only reading Marx's uh, critique of political economy, but we can also use Marx's ideas for politics in order to criticize capitalism from a political point of view, in order to criticize other socialism that for Marx were not radical enough, not revolutionary enough, and also, in order to discuss many topics, I will mention um, them to you later, that are very important for us today. One of them is ecology. But before I go there, now that I ended this uh, um, very short and superficial excursus on Marx's life, I want to share my screen and I want to um, show you this uh, um, chart that I prepared for you. And in this document here, I have uh, indicated on the left side of uh, the uh, screen, the year of publication or the year of writing of Marx's text. And uh, I have indicated on um, in the center um, the title. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger so you can see better than this. And when the book was published by Marx, like the Holy Family, it is indicated like this. But when it was left as a fragmentary a state, uncompleted, unfinished, you can see that the title is between square brackets. This chart is also included in my book, uh, Another Marx, uh, just published in Chinese. And here on the right side, I provide some information about the first editions of these texts made by uh, you know, the editors of Marx. They were Friedrich Engels for, for example, volume two, volume three of Capital, uh, or for example, the thesis on Feuerbach, but then there were other people like Kowski for the theory of surplus value, etc. So I just want to show you how many documents are indicated between square brackets, which means how many things Marx wrote and was not able to finish, to publish, including the Grundrisse, including the manuscript of 1861, including the studies that he did on the Polish question, including wage, price, and profit, including Capital Volume 2 and Capital Volume 3, including the very famous critique of the Gotha program and many other 
text of the late Marx that I will mention later. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time um, to uh, discuss this as I would like to. But I want to call your attention on this part of the chart because this is actually an overview of what I presented in the first part. In this part of the chart, I made a division between Marx's self-published writings and Marx's unfinished manuscript that were published by other people after Marx's death. So let's try to look at the, the chart to see together what are the publications that Marx made in his life. The first book is called The Holy Family, and this is a critique of the young Hegelians. And he published this with Engels, but basically it's uh, Marx's work because he wrote, Engels just wrote 15 pages. This book, Poverty of Philosophy, is a critique of Proudhon. And, um, and Marx is making clear that the ideas of Proudhon are wrong. I'm going to skip some things because I have no time. But in 1848, we have the manifesto of the Communist Party. This text is underlined because it is one of the books that Marx published and that had a significant circulation while Marx was still alive. That's important for me. Even though I want to make clear that the circulation did not start in 1848, but only started at the time of the international, particularly after the Paris Commune. So don't think that the Communist Manifesto, even though it was published at the very right time, at the time of the revolution, just before the revolution of 1848, but it did not circulate a lot. Between 1851 and 1862, Marx published more than 500 articles in the New York Daily Tribune. Um, and I mentioned this to you, Marx was read by more than 200,000 people in the United States and they didn't know that he was uh, such a, a revolutionary thinker. These articles are important for us, um, such a dangerous political thinker. Of course, he was radical in the things that he was writing because they forced Marx, these articles forced Marx to write about topics that he would not have covered if he was only writing about the critique of political economy. So there is a lot that you can see um, for example, Marx about India, Marx about the Crimea War, Marx about the economic crisis of 1857, and I could make many other examples. So we can learn Marx as a journalist, which is you know, very important and very significant in his life, more than a decade with the New York Daily Tribune, but Marx was a journalist also with the many other newspaper, more than 15 years uh, in his entire life, if, if, not, uh, if not more. Marx needed this money to survive. And then you can see these other books, some of them are not known at all, like this one, Herr Fogt, Mr. Fogt, or some of them had a, a very limited circulation and fortune, like the contribution to the critique of political economy. But then at the end of the chart, I have Capital Volume 1, 1867, and the Civil War in France, 1871, underlined because they allowed Marx to be known by the labor movement and by workers um, you know, in many uh, countries, and also European countries, because as I told you, capital was translated in uh, French, in Russian, later after he died in English, and then in more than 70 languages. Now I want to call your attention on this the unfinished manuscript. And you can see that there are many, and they are so important. I mentioned before, the economic manuscript of 1844, the thesis on Feuerbach, the German ideology, the Grundrisse, the theory of surplus value, capital volume two and three, the critique of Goda program. I underline this one because these are very significant books of Marx, right? That had a wide circulation. And they were published after, sometimes they were published 100 years after Marx wrote them. And this is important for us. It's interesting for us, not only, once again, from the point of view of scholarship, of textual scholarship, but also from the point of view of the development of concepts. Because if you think about the concept of alienation, for example, just to mention one, the topic is very well known and is perhaps one of the main topic debated in the entire 20th century, well, this concept completely disappeared until Marx's economical, philosophical 
manuscript of 1844 were published. They were published in 1932, but actually the real circulation of this text started at the end of World War II, right? You know, Hitler took power one year after this. So in order to see the first circulation, the first reception, you have to go at the end of the 40s, at the beginning of the 50s. And of course, this text revolutionized the interpretation of uh, of uh, alienation and you know also helped many interpreters of Marx to demonstrate that he was not a dry thinker only interest in uh, um, in the economics um, so this is the topic with the, the young Marx I want to return to this later and um, there are other examples here so you can see the year of publication indicates how many years Marx's uh, writings had to wait before they were published. Um, I wanna go now to these things that I mentioned before, like the chronological uh, um, table of all the excerpts that Marx did in terms of political economy. So manuscripts, articles, and you know, ex, uh, you know, books, excerpt on political economy, also before the Grundrisse, because Marx has done a lot of work before the Grundrisse, we don't know very much about 1850s because Marx did not publish a lot in this decade. Yeah, it's a little bit similar to the 1870s and to the 1880s. There is a lot of journalism from Marx, right? The New York Daily Tribune, I mentioned this before, but actually Marx also did a very significant research in political economy. He spent a lot of time working on history. Marx did significant historiographical research in the 50s and in the 70s. And you can find these things here, in particular in this interesting no London notebooks that he published in, that he wrote, sorry, these notebooks that he took in um, um, early 80s. And now, I want to call your attention on Engels, his very important role in the making, in the birth of Marxism. These are new editions, new translation, new prefaces of Communist Manifesto, but then also the publication of these books, uh, this manuscript and, of Marx. This is the work made by Engels, volume two, volume three. It take, Engels survived 12 years to Marx. And then of course, socialism, utopian and scientific is, um, a very important uh, text that, uh, that he wrote. There are information also about the edition of Marx and Engels collected writings, but I want to call your attention on this final chart. The idea that there were different Marx and therefore there were discussion about different questions, different topics, and therefore there were different Marxism. So when we talk about Karl Marx, you have to think about the fact that Marx in 1930s is not the same Marx of 1980s, because in this period, in this 50 years, there were many new texts of Marx that were discovered, they were published, and they were translated. For example, when Marx was alive, and where Wilhelm Liebknecht, a leader of the SPD, of the German Social Democratic Party, like, you know, I'm putting here um, uh, a, a typical reader or an activist uh, of this uh, period, 1860s. So this is what he knew about Marx. Only the Communist Manifesto, Capital Volume 1, for the few who read and studied carefully this text, and the Civil War of Marx, more in general, the addresses, the resolution, the programs of the First International. The second example that I want to give is Lenin. Lenin in the 1910, uh, at the, in the first decade of the 20th century. Well, he knew the introduction of 1857. There were two new volumes of Capital, very important for Lenin, the critique of the Gotha program and also the theory of surplus value. This is not the end, not at all, because if you now go move forward a few more decades and you have interpretations that are very different, Jean-Paul Jean -Paul Sartre or Louis Althusser, they were in competition, right? But they are reading a different Marx. They are reading the economical manuscript of 1844, the German ideology, the thesis on Feuerbach, the critique of Hegel doctrine of the state. So all the young Marx, all the early writings actually came out in this period and were translated in this period. In China, a little bit later, 
but uh, it was just a question of time. And if you take, for example, uh, um, a well-known interpreter of Marx today, um, uh, Antonio Negri, Tony Negri, I'm thinking about now the 70s, the 80s, well, the Grundrisse were published, the Chinese uh, translation, a little bit before this, the English translation, 1973, the Grundrisse was an important text in order to demonstrate that alienation was still there and Marx had not written about alienation only when he was young. So against the interpretation of the epistemological break of Louis Althusser. But there is also the possibility of reading the New York Daily Tribune articles on India, on China, for example. You know, now there were books published on this because, you know, where they were published, in the, in the United States, well, you know, nobody knew these books. No, no, nobody has edited carefully the uh, journalism of Marx. And then these texts that are very important for me, the excerpt on Henry Morgan, anthropology or the note of Kowalewski, very important for the late Marx. And then there is us today, 2022, in Shanghai today, if you are a young scholar of Marx, as I mentioned before, you can now read Capital in all its drafts, because in 2013, now we have the 15th volume of Capital finally translated, sorry, finally edited and published in the Mega. And we are also reading the manuscript of 1844, the German ideology, in a new way, not in this way like if it was a book, but in a way that presents uh, the text as an unfinished text, as an unfinished book. And if there are questions and debates, we can talk about the German ideology if you want, or I uh, published several articles on the manuscript of 1844. They were also translated in Chinese. And then, as I mentioned before, we have many notebooks of excerpts, in particular in uh, at the end of Marx's life. So I'll now return to you, and you can see me in full screen, because I would like to take uh, the final uh, five minutes, perhaps a little bit more, if the chair uh, allow me, to discuss a little bit about this question of um, the young Marx, the early writings of Marx and the late Marx, that I consider a sort of forgotten chapter of Marx intellectual biogra biography for a very long time. So, when there was this uh, new wave of Marx and Marxism that I try to, you know, explain and demonstrate in the chart in the 1950s, in the 1960s, with the publication of this texts written by Marx when he was only 25, 26, 27 years old, and uh, there are this interpretation about alienation against Soviet Union, against this dogmatic, rigid, and economicistic Marxism of Moscow, well, the debate was whether the young Marx was better than the Marx of capital. You know, some people, uh, they were so crazy about this that they exceeded in representing this young Marx, I told you, a Marx that had just started the critique of political economy, a Marx that was just 25, 26 years old, and they were so audacious in their interpretation to say that this Marx was more important than capital, you know, impossible. But um, at the same time, in Moscow or in other a country where there was the so-called actually existing socialism, these readings of Marx were negated. And actually some of these texts were not translated or were not included in the collected works uh, of, uh, um, of Marx and Engels. This is also what happened in Soviet Union, like, you know, um, these uh, ideas against alienation, uh, they might have seen as uh, dangerous ideas to, uh, to go against the, 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 the government in, in Soviet Union. So they had a lower circulation and not only there. Or for example, the critique that Marx wrote on, on Russia, this is something that was never translated into Russia. The first edition of this text, a text of uh, international relation that Marx actually published himself. I'm not talking about manuscript, I'm talking about publications of Marx in 1857. Um, it is something that uh, in Moscow was uh, forbidden to be read and, and circulate. So I believe that actually the best interpretation is trying to understand that these um, texts of Marx are interesting, are useful, that uh, 
uh, it was bad to not disseminate this, uh, you know, important and very brilliant part of Marx. But of course, and there is a continuation between the young Marx and the Marx that is criticizing political economy later. So I do not share the interpretation of epistemological break so rigid of Althusser, but at the same time, it will be crazy to argue that Marx basically lost, spent his entire life doing nothing if the early writings were already the document or the place where Marx had already conceived the most interesting political ideas of his life. I also invite you to read the Communist Manifesto in the same way. The Communist Manifesto is not the place where you will find Marx political ideas, Marx political problems. Marx wrote that in 1848. Marx and Engels clearly said there is an historical document. If you want to read the more advanced um, programs written by Marx, you can read the um, political program of the French Socialist Party that Marx contributed to write at uh, the um, um, end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, actually. So at the very last uh, phase of his life. So when we read Marx's text, I, mean, I think that we have to make a clear distinction between the text that Marx published, but even in that category, we have to be careful because not all the texts that Marx published represent the final point of view of Marx, because later he evolved his ideas. Then there are the preparatory texts of Marx, right? All this manuscript that I've been trying to show you with my chart and with my presentation. Then there is something important that is Marx's journalism that belongs to another category. Sometimes Marx is also writing these articles because he needed $2 per piece in order to survive. So we cannot say that in every a newspaper article that is the final take on Marx on that point. And then there is also the correspondence. The correspondence, the letters, they are important because Marx and Engels used to use the letters in order to create, uh, you know, a class consciousness and in order to provide information to other uh, activists in, in other countries. So read Marx and make distinctions between among the different kind of writings that um, he left us. And now I want to go to what I called before the forgotten chapter of Marx, the late Marx. I'm gonna take a few more minutes if I, if I please may. Um, so the late Marx is um, um, a, a question mark. It has been a question mark for interpreters of Marx, for the biographers of Marx, because actually, as I told you before, he has not published anything, or he has published very few things from the end of the International. So usually, when you look at the Marx Engels Werke, the German edition of Marx Engels writing, the Marx Engels collected writings in English, you find very few things. You find just one volume from 1875 to 1883. So many people said, you know what, Marx had um, already done all he could do, and Marx was uh, uh, too tired, he had, uh, you know, um, uh, health issues, or sometimes there were some malicious interpretation, Marx could not finish capital, and therefore he couldn't contribute with anything else. So what I try to argue with my book, The Last Years of Karl Marx, is that not only Marx continued his research in the last decade of his life, and I've been demonstrating this with particular evidence for the last three years of his life, 1881 to 1883. Not only he continued his research, but actually he expanded his research to many new disciplines and also to many new topics. And finally, last but not least, these topics are very relevant for us because actually we can learn a lot from topics that are at the center of the political agenda today. I'm talking about ecology. I'm talking about gender emancipation. I'm talking about the critique of nationalism. I'm talking about the emancipatory potential of technology. I'm talking about the collective ownership of the means of production, but not controlled by the state. So as an alternative to capitalism, I'm talking about migration. I'm talking about individual freedom. These are all issues that Marx is working on or issues to which Marx, on which Marx is returning at the end 
of his life. And this demonstrated that Marx was not a Eurocentric, not fixated on class conflict alone, not, democrat not dogmatic and not economistic. So I think this is important to um, um, pay attention to this. And in my opinion, uh, the scholarship of Marx is going to uh, provide um, even more contributions in the next years, particularly based on these uh, notebooks and on the studies of Karl Marx. And, uh, you know, I would like to talk a little bit today about the fact that Marx, perhaps in the second part, answering to your question, that Marx is expanding his view and now is looking at the global south or is looking at capitalism on a global scale with even more attention that Marx is also working a lot on the pre-capitalist economies. That's important, that's interesting. Marx is doing a lot of research on Mexico, on Algeria, on India. And I will try to explain this more later if there are questions or comments or criticism. And then also, I want to say that some of this uh, work that Marx is doing are not only intellectual work, but they are actually connected with political issues of the time. For example, while Marx is reading uh, Morgan and while Marx is doing these studies on pre-capitalist society, well, he is receiving a letter from Vera Zasulic from Russia. And in this letter, Marx is asked as a political activist, as one of the most important, if not already the most important, like influential, important, I mean, influential leader of the labor movement of the time, Vera Zasulic is asking to Marx, what should we do in a country where capitalism is not developed? Should we wait that capitalism is developing and therefore we are not doing any political activism for at least 100 years? Or is it possible to skip capitalism and to do the revolution now? So Marx is interested in these things politically. Marx is looking at ancient society not only to go back to history to check his uh, uh, historical materialistic interpretation of history, but Marx is trying also to understand these things to you know better realize what to do in political terms. This is why I want to tell you that we can say that Marx almost died. Like one of the few things that he was doing was to put together you know um, an, an historical chronology. I talk about this in my book. Um, uh, he returned to the study of, of history and not only in Europe, there is also a lot on the Middle East, for example, and not only in political economy, but there is also a lot on politics. And Marx is actually uh, trying to find confirmation of his ideas, going back to history and looking at the main historical events that change society from, you know, uh, the birth of Jesus Christ before then actually to uh, 1648 to the war to the 30 year war. So I have a lot to discuss about this if you want. And you know, I also want to mention that Marx is very skeptical of um, sort of um, interpretations of scholars, even of people who were critical about uh, um, capitalism, like, for example, Kowalewski. Marx has learned a lot from Maxim Kowalewski, uh, a Russian sociologist, but they were, according to Marx, wrongly projected the parameters of the European context onto other society. So Marx is very different from this interpretation of Eurocentric, of, uh, you know, Orientalist, etc. Because Marx is saying we cannot use categories that we apply to the analysis of feudalism and trying to use the same categories to interpret, to understand the society in China, the society in India. Marx was highly skeptical about the transfer of this interpretative category between completely different historical or geographical context. So this is another lesson that we might keep in mind when we talk about Marx. And I wanna end the presentation by you know, giving this message that usually Marx has been read as the author where to find the 
answers for everything, right? So you go back to Marx in these books that sometimes were published like religious books, like, you know, a Bible, the German ideology, look like, you know, a red text, like a Quran with all the information inside. But actually, the very interesting Marx, and, you know, it's almost, you know, it's extremely exciting to read this Marx, the Marx of the manuscript, of the unfinished manuscript, is a Marx that is asking many questions to himself. I want to end my lecture, my presentation with this note. And the fact that there is such a brilliant mind that has done already so much and uh, that was very strongly, highly motivated to finish volume two, to complete his masterpiece and to publish volume two. But on the contrary, Marx in 1869, two years after he published volume one, he wanted to learn a new language, Russian. And he started to read all these documents, all these books about Russia. And then he's asking for more information from Indonesia, from Egypt, from India, from Maghreb, from United States. He's crazy, he's writing to all the comrades of the international, just give me books, give me statistics. I want to understand capitalism in the United States. I want to understand the changes after civil war in the United States and the changes after the end of serfdom in 1861 in Russia. There's two changes, 61, 65 in the United States, 61 in Russia. So for me, this is very useful. And this is an example that we should have uh, as scholars, like being always dissatisfied with what we have, being always critical. And like Marx did in the past, return to documents, return to books, and try to check our ideas and be critical. So from this point of view, we can read in the last Marx, in the last phase of his life, but not only in this period, in particular, but not only, the assertion that Marx did, like, you know, we said, we have to do this, we have to do that, the publications, right? I told you, going back to Marx to see what Marx told us to do. But interesting are also the questions that Marx asked, the doubts that he had. So it is good to return to Marx and not only focus on, you know, a sort of ideology that we can think is ended or is already finished, but going back to Marx to continue his work. And it is very useful to, with the help of these new editions, with the help of this new literature of Marx, of this new interpretation that have been published around the world, with so many new books on ecology, with so many new books of historical interpretation, with so many new books about the politics of Marx in the first international, etc. we can return to an author that is still essential to understand the society in which we live. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Musto. I think it's a, a very interesting topic and uh, you've shared with us, uh, of course, a very general, but at the same time, very vivid and uh, a rich picture of Marx, Marx intellectual life and Marx, uh, I think, uh, uh, all of the details that maybe we, we know, but we sometimes we uh, neglect or ignore uh, when we focus more on uh, a certain kind of um, traditional dogmatic image uh, of um, Marx thinking. So I think the, the, your, your lecture are very uh, interesting, and very enlightening for our audience, not only for our uh, students, but also for our Chinese scholars who um, do some studies on um, researchers on uh, Marxism or Marxist studies. So uh, Milan, how shall we proceed? Maybe you, you prefer to come uh... Okay, I, I'll go first. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for Professor Smosto's very uh, illuminating and inspiring lectures. Uh, this is the book you mentioned, another Marx in Chinese version. Yeah, and uh, yeah, if anyone's interested, you can buy it now <laughs> online. So um, as you talk about uh, going back to Marx and the Marxist revival, it reminds me of a very interesting phenomenon I noticed these years that uh, I think uh, professional scholars or students, PhD students who studied Marxism philosophy, we don't usually read Marx biography 
I don't know why, but uh, myself, I, I think maybe it's because I think biography is not a philosophy book, it's some, something like a story book. So I, I didn't read too much biography of Mark's life before. Um, so, um, so in your lectures, if I may conclude that uh, going back to Marx, especially for our Chinese scholars, there is two important stage. Then one stage is that uh, we should abandon the stereotype or the textbook figure of Marx, uh, because we started to started to learn Marx from very young age, uh, but we don't really know his manuscript and the biography. So the second stage is that we should go back to the manuscript to read his uh, his uh, um, actual draft, like some of the book you said, we took it as a book, but it's not actually a whole book. It's just some pieces put in together. So, um, and going back to biography and the intellectual biography of Marx's life is important because we have to know what real problem that, uh, and the historical circumstances that Marx is facing at the moment that, that helps us to understand the, the, why Marx say something. And uh, his work is not an abstract thing that, uh, like a philosophical thing, he is uh, uh, very aiming to a certain historical moment. So my questions and comment is related to, to, to this, because we, when we say that we go back to Marx, not only could we clarify some misunderstanding, but also it could bring more confusions and problems. For example, when I'm writing my PhD thesis, one of the, my chapter is about nationalism. So I read Marx's assertion and the attitude toward nationalism. And I notice that uh, there is something not very consistent in, in Marx's work. Uh, for example, there is a famous one that Marxists say that, po po that Marxists support uh, Poland people to fight against this Russia because it's an intrusion action. But it's not only because this is an intrusion, this is a war, not a, a, it's an evil war, but it's because of other conflict reasons that uh, Marxists, Marx support the uh, nationalism action. And because we know that in general, Marx don't su that didn't support uh, um, nationalism action because he thinks that uh, it would weaken the power of uh, working class and uh, it's it's actually a patriotic uh, uh, like false consciousness or something like that but for some reason when Marx is faced with uh, a certain um, uh, political issue that he sometimes supports nationalism actions uh, like he support uh, Irish rebellion group Finney group and he even tried to get the First Man Association to support this uh, this action. So uh, my point is, do you think if we're really going back to Marxist mega two, and uh, there is a lot of, uh, uh, as you mentioned, Marx wrote some political comment for the New York Tribune. And uh, do you think um, those inconsistency, like you said, is not a Marx final word, but how could we find what is Marx final word toward one topic if, uh, if it is just so different? And do you think it, it would uh, damage the validity, validity of Marx's theory? And uh, uh, this is my first question. Another question is about uh, what you said in your last part of your presentation about uh, a late Marx is forgotten by the scholars now. And uh, a lot of people say that young, young Marx is more important because, uh, you know, for a lot of reasons. So, and you said that the late Marx have already ex had actually expanded a lot of topic. It has, uh, he has a lot of uh, concern about uh, pre-capitalism and something like that. But, you know, a lot of scholars criticize late Marx that, uh, he abandoned class struggle and uh, he, so they say is uh, in one of your articles that is a uh, political Marx against uh, uh, economic Marx. But I think um, it is related to a bigger question that uh, um, when Marx noticed uh, class struggle that he actually put 
human actions in a very important position. But late Marx, when he go back to the political economy, he actually, in his own word, he took the rule of capital as a capital as a Aaron law. So even we know, even if we know what's going to happen in the next stage, we can't jump this stage. The only thing we can do is to, you know, to reduce the pain that we're going through that stage. So it seems to me that late Marx take the rule of capital as something more important to, to the human actions. And you said Marx started to uh, read books about pre-capitalism. Do you think it is some some kind of uh, uh, that Marx some something that Marx tried to break the rule of capital that he thinks that some small parts of the world outside of Europe has the potential to, to break the law of, of capital. So that's all my comments and uh, questions. I'm eager to hear your um, response later after Professor Wang, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mina. But I mean, if uh, Professor must prefer to answer immediately, maybe, I, I don't know. It depends all on together, all together. I'm fine. I'm looking forward to your comments. Okay. Okay. So uh, I, I, I just like to make some uh, general remarks because I share some uh, impressions with Milan. I think your 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 presentation, your talk is very uh, interesting and general, and uh, it really uh, I think uh, uh, enriches our understanding of Marx, and especially on the methodological level. I think. Because uh, I, I I can feel that you focus a little uh, very much on the philological uh, work, which is indisp indispensable to our understanding of uh, Marx. Not only Marx as a person, but also uh, Marx as a, a thinker and as a writer. I think it's very important. Of course, um, philology can never substitute our theoretical understanding of Marx uh, ideas and Marx uh, works, right? But uh, if we don't understand and um, how like some of uh, Mark, uh, Marx's books um, have been constructed, have been written and have been published or how uh, he chose finally to not publish some of his uh, manuscripts. All these uh, details maybe seem uh, unrelevant, but actually uh, in last instance is very important to our understanding. So maybe um, uh, what you said on for example, the, when we distinguish the, the self-published uh, books of Marx and the unpublished, unself-published uh, books of Marx, I, I think this kind of distinction, uh, this kind of work is very, uh, very valuable. And uh, uh, we, um, and the, the second point here that uh, it makes us very clear about one point that Marx is not should not be considered as a kind of a theoretical uh, idol, right? He's uh, at first, he's a very concrete person. He's lived in a very concrete uh, historical con conjuncture. So how Marx, um, like, let's say, how um, grow up as a this thinker. And I, I think all this kind of uh, information you shared uh, come to um, enrich our understanding on, on, on this point. And uh, I also learned one thing very important and very interesting at least uh, to, for, for, for me, is that the capitalism or the critique of capitalism is not, not the only topic, and not the largest, the biggest, the most important topic uh, for Marx thinking. He also, uh, he's also interested in I think there is a problem in the connection of yeah. Professor Zhang. So you want me to- Gen Gender, the, the question of gender, am I lost in you? I think yeah, the we, connection- uh, we, yeah. we lost you, we lost you for, uh, for a few oh, seconds. Sorry. Yeah. No problem. You were mentioning other topic beside the critique of- Kahn. Yeah, yeah, I, I just said, yeah. I, I just said uh, Marx was not interesting solely in capitalism and in, the, in a kind of critique of capitalism. He may be um, his interest in uh, at first in all human activities, I think, but uh, in all human activities uh, on which he tried to uh, share some lights, 
because he considered you know, all the uh, human activities as a certain kind of historical formation. So how to understand the human activities in general on one side, but on the other side, how to understand these uh, human activities with their historical formation, with their historical um, determinations. I think the, both parts are very important and very crucial to, to, to Marx's uh, work. So what I try to, uh, the, the point I try to, uh, I'm trying to make here is that Marx is not this kind of, um, let's say, uh, idol or god or hero for human emancipation or for, for human liberation. Of course he is, but not only this, he's also, uh, for himself, he's tried to learn a lot during his life, right? So when we, uh, today, when we try to uh, follow Marx, we also claim that we try to follow, we should learn from Marx learn from Marx and learn from Angus. We try to follow Marx's path, uh, follow Marx's thinking, follow Marx's uh, methods to understanding the current human society and so on and so on. But we, maybe we do not do enough, like for, uh, we are not interested enough in other uh, phenomenon. We only focus maybe in uh, criticizing the so-called capitalism, the big enemy, but we don't really, have this kind of uh, ability. We don't really have this kind of uh, sensibility to different issues, to different tissue, uh, details of the so-called capitalism. Uh, we are not sensible uh, to the historical and actual variation, variations of the, 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 the society we're living in as Marx did in during his time, right? And so I think this is uh, the point I uh, which is most important for me uh, after hearing your, uh, your, your, your lecture. So if I, uh, I may uh, raise one question, it's also a very general question. So all the remarks I, I've been uh, made uh, were very general, but the last question I, I try to raise is also uh, very general. So since you know, in, uh, in China, in China, in Chinese Academy, uh, when we uh, talk about Marxism or Marx thinking, we have two, kinds of institutions. We have, uh, like uh, in Fudan University, we have uh, philosophy school, philosophy department, and we have the school of, um, how do you say, uh, uh, the theory of Marx. Uh, Marx is the theory department, right? So, but uh, in, in, in uh, either way, we think Marx is uh, a philosopher. But the question of the role of philosophy played in Marx thinking is very complicated one. It's also a very controversial there's a raised a lot of controversies uh, during the during the last centuries. So uh, according to your picture, according to your uh, re uh, present reintroduction of the revival of Marx, but Marx not only as a uh, an idol, but first of all as a concrete person living in his uh, history, encountering um, different political, intellectual, social movements. So according to your picture of Marx, what's the role uh, by term philosophy in your whole picture? And if we are trying to do, if there ex ex really exists something called uh, Marx philosophy, Marxist philosophy or Marxian philosophy, uh, how do we understand the term of philosophy here in this uh, story? Yeah, I'll, I'll put it in another way, in, a, in an easier way. When we say we are, doing uh, Marxist philosophy, what, are, what, what we are really doing now, right? Because according to your picture, Marx was not only a philosopher in some sense of this term. I mean, he's, he was excluded from, he, he, he didn't have the access to the German university as a professor, right? So he, uh, um, he was more activist. Uh, he read for himself all the documents, um, all the journals, papers he read. He read, but uh, with the purpose to get all the information, necessary information to understand human activities in his time. So when we say today that we are doing philosophy, we focus on Marx's uh, books, so-called philosophical books, political economical books, and so on. But we are doing theoretic, theoretical work, right? We are not uh, looking at the world. We are not studying the world. Uh, with the eyes in the manner as Marx used to do during his whole life. So what do you think uh, when we say that we are doing Marxian or Marxist philosophy? 
So there's a, for me, uh, personally speaking, there's something very paradoxical here. We are for, when we are trying to uh, insist on the fact that Marx was so, uh, uh, such a great philosopher, right? He's maybe the number one philosopher among all, I don't know, uh, before Heidegger, before Wittgenstein. So he was the top one in, uh, philosopher. So when we say that, what do we really mean? Uh, are we not risking, uh, running the risk of um, in another way, but make Marx a kind of idol, right? That means losing his real connection with his own world. That may be something Marx tried to um, not do during his whole life. So I, I just want to have your, your own opinions on this kind of what I call a paradoxical dimension of Marxian philosophy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much to Professor Zhang and to Professor uh, um, uh, Wang. I just wanted to ask you, how much time do you want me to spend in the um, answers to your questions? Because I also know that there are uh, questions from the audience and that I would love to receive also in the chat. So later when you tell me, I can read it. But how much time do I have? Um, I think maybe, because uh, uh, there are 30 minutes left for us, maybe, 15 to 20 years, that's sufficient for you? Yeah, no, no, not more than that. Otherwise, we will have no time to discuss with the audience. And it's also yeah, nice yeah, yeah. to receive questions from the students. So forgive me if I will be a little bit uh, superficial. But uh, the topic that uh, uh, both Professor Zhang and Professor Wang introduced, they are very um, useful. And actually, in some cases, they are a continuation. In particular, the things that uh, Professor uh, Wang just said, the continuation to the things that I mentioned in my talk. And I actually am uh, very glad to see that we share the same interpretation on so many points. I would like to start to the pre-question of uh, Professor Zhang, the question of the importance of intellectual biographies. Well, you know, they are not work uh, book of philosophy, they are work on, on, of history, you said, but, you know, a bio biography, if it is an intellectual biography, it is a text that, uh, you know, should be required sometimes, particularly uh, for a complicated life like Marx's life, and particularly for the kind of distinction that I made in Marx's writing, four categories, published, unpublished, and then letters, notebooks, and also trying to understand in each of these categories, how can you know? You can understand if this text is something that Marx was not satisfied, wanted to return on this, when you read the letters or when you know, uh, thanks to other documents that Marx was going to make changes on this. So this helped you because as Professor Wang said, well, the philological work is important. I will say philological work should be the base for theory, particularly for a, a work like Marx. So I, from time to time, I will also try to mix your question and your comments because I found them very useful and also interrelated in a couple of points. So I would like to discuss the first question, that is the question of nationalism. And uh, uh, Professor Zhang told me, this is not always clear. Marx's uh, position is not always clear. Yes, I mentioned this before. I said that sometimes Marx can also be seen as contradictory in some of his ideas, because as also Professor Wang said, Marx is a human being. So he didn't have the time to sit or write a book or write an article and say, you know, on war, we should be doing this. On cooking uh, Chinese food, we should be doing this. On traveling to India, we should go to Kolkata and not to Delhi first. And also it's not only that Marx could not do this, is that Marx did not want to do this, right? You know, that Marx did not want to write the recipe for the cookshop of the future, as he wrote many times. He didn't want to be considered his ideas, his theories for like a prescription for what the society should have done in the future. But I must say that it is possible for us to continue Marx's work and also make sense of what Marx wrote, because it's not that Marx was, you know, getting up one day and writing something and the day after writing something else. And I would like to make some examples in relation to the interesting things that were mentioned by Professor Zhang. One example is that Marx is usually against Russia. 
almost always against Russia. Sometimes Marx has been considered Russo Russophobic, right? Because every time that there was a geopolitical fight, Marx was uh, not supporting Russia and was hoping that Russia was going to uh, lose the conflict. Why Marx is taking this position? Marx is taking this position because Russia is the power of the counter revolution and he knows that if Russia is strong, there are less chances for the labor movement, for the democratic movement in Europe to win. Therefore, Poland and the independence of Poland is an essential element in order to emancipate not only the people, I will return to this later, but also to have a free and democratic and in the end socialist Europe um, uh, as a consequence. But I must say that Marx is not rigid, is not uh, dogmatic. And actually, when there is an important movement in Russia, the populist movement, this term populism has nothing to do with the negative objective that we use today, populism at the time meant anti left, anti capitalist, then Marx is actually going to support and Marx is going to uh, believe that the revolution can actually start there. I'm not talking about this now because actually the second question of Professor Zhang is exactly related to this. And I think that on this point, I would like to make an important clarification, or we may have another debate with her later. So if Marx is against Russia for geopolitical reasons, right, and we should look at this because it is not just one principle like France should always win because French Revolution was there, right? There is another question that is an important question. And Professor Zhang, if I took my notes correctly, she said, for certain reason. At some point, for certain reason, Marx is supporting this. Well, that certain reason is an important reason for Marx, is a reason of liberation, of national liberation. That should not be confused with nationalism. One thing is national liberation, and one thing is nationalism. So when Poland was occupied, you know that there is the famous debate between Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg, but Poland is under occupation. And this is a question of liberation. And Professor Zhang very uh, well mentioned the uh, Irish, right, in England. This is a question of liberation for them. And Marx is, of course, supporting Ireland. And Marx is also making sure that in the international, there is a section of Irish worker. And at the end of the international, very few people know this, Marx suggests and got the approval also against some workers, some British workers to have an Irish worker as the head of the international of the uh, Central Committee in London. So these things are very significant politically because emancipation is not possible without equality. Emancipation is not possible if there is one nation or one ethnicity or whatever that is exploited by others or that is submitted by others. So Marx is very careful, of course, going against nationalism, of course, to do international solidarity, etc. But this not mean that, I don't know, one superpower has the right to, you know, conquest everything and to put under their um, state um, many other countries. So this is a reason why Marx is in favor of the liberation of these oppressed nationalities like Poland or like um, Ireland. But Professor Zhang, also let me tell you, like for example, Algeria uh, against the oppression of France, right? This is also important. I don't know if Professor Zhang is there. I think I lost her and their connection might be bad, but uh, I hope that uh, the point is, uh, is clear. So the second question made by Professor Zhang is about the late Marx. Well, I disagree with this interpretation that the late Marx abandoned class struggle. On the contrary, on the contrary, I will say that this interpretation of not being able to jump a stage, right? Not being able to break the law of capitalism is an interpretation that many Marxists had. 
but not Marx himself, because Marx is actually uh, explicitly writing that, uh, you know, he's uh, giving the support to the populist movement and human action is actually essential, is fundamental for Marx. I would like to read, I haven't been reading any documents or quotations so far, but I would like to mention a very important intellectual depth that Marx had with uh, this uh, Russian scholar, his name was Chernyshevsky, right? So Marx discovered that the idea of Chernyshevsky, who was a leader of Russian populism, who was in favor of bypassing the capitalist mode of production. So this is against this dogmatic doctrine that says that, you know, there is the um, slavery, feudalism, capitalism, socialism, and communism, and, you know, history stages, and they are very rigid. Marx is actually saying the opposite and saying that it is possible to bypass capitalism. And uh, he is using the ideas that Chernyshevsky wrote in a book called The Critique of Philosophical Prejudice Against Communal Ownership of the Land, published in 1859. So interestingly, in this uh, document, in this book, Chernyshevsky wrote, when a social phenomenon has reached a high level of development in one nation, its progression to that stage in another, more backward nation may occur rather more quickly than it did in, it, in the advanced nation. So basically, you don't have to wait 1,500 years of um, life or free market or development of capitalism, etc., to see in New Zealand the same things that happen in London. And thanks to this, thanks to the contact that the backward society, the backward nation, the expression is of Chernyshevsky, had with the advanced nation, well, it is possible to bring changes in that society much, much faster than happened in the first society. So a social phenomenon leaps directly from the lower stage to the higher level, avoiding intermediate stages along the way. Marx learned this from Chernyshevsky. Marx is in favor of this, not only as an interpretation of capitalism, uh, but also in terms of uh, political action, political activity. So Chernyshevsky is saying New Zealanders will now will know from books about the existence of protectionist system, but it will have no application in their real life. It is possible to skip from one stage to another. So the two conclusions, the conclusion I will just focus on one that Chernyshevsky is doing, that is under this, the influence of the high development which a certain phenomenon of social life has attained among the most advanced peoples, this phenomenon can develop very swiftly among other people and rise from a lower level straight to the higher one, passing over the intermediate logical moment. So I see that Professor Zhang is back. Um, Marx is against this economicistic interpretation that we cannot break the stages and that capitalism must happen. This is an interpretation, Vera Zasulic said that many Marxists had, but Marx said, for this kind of reason, I'm not a Marxist, because these were not the ideas of Marx. And Marx is actually very optimistic and also very interested about the political fight of the populist movement in Russia. So Professor Zhang, I said, human action is actually essential for Marx and is not doing a deterministic interpretation and the late Marx has not abandoned class struggle. Actually, I will say the late Marx is understanding class struggle better and is understanding that class struggle can start in other countries, doesn't have to start where capitalism is more developed. And Marx is also supporting class struggle also as a liberation movement, like for example, the people in Algeria, they were oppressed by the French and French people were introducing capitalism against this communal form of property, this communal form of production. Well, Marx is saying this is clearly better. It is better that society stays like that. And then of course is not making the mistake of considering that this is socialism. Socialism is something else. Capitalism is indispensable for socialism, but we don't need to suffer all the disaster of socialism in every society. I would like to mention also the question of India. Marx is also considered 
for the, his position on India for the article that he wrote when he was only 35 years old in the New York Daily Tribune, the future results of British rule of India, right? When Marx said the very well-known sentence, England has to fulfill a double mission. One is the destructive mission and another one is the regenerating the annihilation of the old Asiatic society. Of course, Marx is against the old Asiatic society because the old Asiatic society is not helping the emancipation also from the point of view of the superstition of religion, of gender, of patriarchy in the household, etc. All right, so this is a position in 1853. By the way, Marx is never embracing colonialism, colonialism and supporting colonialism at the time. But when Marx is returning on history later, when Marx is also looking at the effect of capitalism, two more decades, three more decades, and reading also new sources, not only the sources of racist anthropologists of the time, well, Marx takes an even stronger position against what he called the vandalism of British people. They were punishing native people and they were pushing native people, according to Marx, not forwards, but actually backwards. And Marx wrote, all the British managed to do was just to ruin native agriculture and double the number of severity and famines. So Marx is clearly against this and we cannot see a philosophy of history in Marx or Eurocentricism in Marx. Now, for lack of time, I have to go as quick as possible to uh, Professor Wang, and he will forgive me if I will be very superficial, but he actually helped me a lot because some of the things that he said were contribution to my um, uh, thesis. And actually also, they might help me to clarify one point. When I talk about another Marx, when I talk about reading this Marx with this, all these new documents, this, all these new texts, etc. Well, I just want to make sure that I do not share the idea that the Marx that we knew before was completely different or that the generation before us didn't know anything about Marx or that all the Chinese translation before um, are not good in order to make us understand Marx's idea, Marx's theories. Not at all. So I am against these things that I call the drama of the discovery. Every time there is a new manuscript of Marx, every time there is a new document, there are some scholars who believe that you know, we finally can understand the final Marx, et cetera. If you go back to my chart, you can see that there were very important new Marxes. Like, for example, the publication of, you know, volume two, volume three, made by Engels, or the early writings, they all came together from the end of the 20s, the beginning of the 30s, and started to circulate in the 50s. Or, for example, the Grundrisse, or the studies about anthropology, ethnology, that were published by Lawrence Crowder in the 70s, all right? But today, we do not have a corpus of Marx writings or manuscripts that can, you know, shake and change the interpretation of Marx can, that we have. But we have many adjustments that we can do, but we have many things that help us to understand the directions that Marx was taking or the methodology of Marx or the self-criticism of Marx even better than before. But another Marx for me does not mean that all the people who read Marx before were wrong. It is just a way to see this Marx that is more critical uh, and then, you know, all this Marxism or the nominal Marxism, Marxist-Leninism of the 20th century. And this is also connected with this refusal of treating Marx as an idol, as a god, as Professor um, Wang said, right? And also, very interesting, the fact that Marx, as I also tried to say, it, was interested in all human activities and... Uh, this is also interesting for me, this is useful for me, because I believe that capitalism today pervades any aspect of human life and everywhere, in China, like in North America, like in Europe. It is much stronger than at Marx's time, and therefore Marx critique is even more useful and perhaps even more uh, the critique of capitalism, the analysis of capitalism, this attempt to understand the laws, the tendencies of capitalism is even stronger than then. 
Now, the final question is this issue of Marx philosophy. I think that Professor Wang will not disagree with me if I say that uh, I am against, in general, for every author, as you know, for scholarship in general, to have divisions of fields and to divide authors like this is a philosopher, this is a sociologist, this is a political economist. You know, this is a, a very, you know, some Marxists criticize this uh, bourgeois way of organizing the academias, the field, et cetera. And in the case of Marx, we cannot deny that the main preoccupation of Marx is writing the critique of capitalism and therefore is the study of political economy. This is clear. If you read all the notebooks of Marx, if you see all the studies that Marx did in his life, the majority of them, even though as Professor Wang said, he was interested in all human activities, but the big majority of them were related to the critique of capitalism. So the critique of Marx is a critique of political economy. And if I may say something, that is a little bit, uh, um, you know, surprising for me, and also it is not good about the new tendencies in Chinese academia, if I am not wrong, for the very little that I know, is that Marx is absent in economics, is absent in political economy, and that when I come to China today, I'm mostly invited in departments of philosophy, in department of Marxism, but then there is no Marxism in political economy, which is very similar to what capitalism and capitalist countries did in the past. And sometimes, you know, I had embarrassing talks at the uh, topics of, uh, you know, groups of uh, PhD lectures, a PhD in economics, and they didn't know about, you know, class struggle and that actually economics is the ideology of bourgeoisie and that there are conflicts that are connected to politics. So this is something interesting for us and also to observe uh, China. So I don't want that the critique of capitalism of Marx is put into a corner and therefore we just talk about the philosophy of Marx and then capitalism is expanding and then the market is expanding also in societies like China. I think this is an important point on which we want to return and work together with the Chinese colleagues. So Marx most essentially as a critique of political economy, Marx, of course, as an activist, Marx also, of course, as a revolutionary who wanted to change the world. And as Lenin said, without revolutionary idea, without a revolutionary new philosophy, there is no possibility to change in praxis, etc. But the question of philosophy is, for me, very much related to this uh, debate of the past, like you know, Marx the philosopher or Marx the economist against Marx the, the politician. Um, you remember Schumpeter, for example, like this kind of author who tried to divide it, you know, the critical analysis of Marx then with, uh, you know, recipes or the political message of Marx. But I do not want to evade the question. And I would like to say that the philosophy of Marx from the very beginning, from when it started, it is a philosophy that was extremely critical, actually was at war. It is not time, not nice to say this word now in particular, but you know, the strongest possible conflict with the speculative philosophy, with the philosophy of this generation of scholars of Hegel with whom, with whom Marx had shared so much including political activism, that they believed that they could sit at the top of the mountain, like in the ancient Greek, and tell working class what to do. So if you read these texts of Marx in the early 40s, they are brilliant, they're wonderful from this point of view. And this is also why Marx is fighting against Feuerbach in the end, why Marx is disappointed by Feuerbach in the end, because he didn't do the final step from philosophy to politics, right? And this is also why Marx is later looking for uh, alternative to this interpretation of mere ideas, philosophy like an analysis of mere ideas. This does not mean that the philosophy of Marx is dry economics. It is just the analysis of surplus value. This is why I you know, share and I look at this um, continuity in the um, interpretation of Marx 
from his early writings to his work of political economy. So there is a continuity. There is a Marx that is doing critique of capitalism. But for this reason, the reason of emancipation of the working class, the reason of end a society with emancipation, with alienation, sorry, with exploitation, and to turn into another one. But of course, when we look at this continuity, we cannot argue like many interpreters, the majority, Professor Wang, I would say interpreters of Marx in the Department of Philosophy that say that this Marx is more important than the Marx of Capital. And I believe that there is a very important research that I've also already started to do with some publication, with some, you know, also concrete analysis of the dissemination and reception of Marx, that many of these scholars had not read Capital and had not worked enough on these very complicated books, particularly now, books of 15 volumes of preparatory materials, it was much easier to read the manuscript of 1844, to read some parts of the German ideology. And in some countries, when I was talking about different Marxists and different Marx, you actually see that there is a reception of Marx without capital, that there is a Marxism without capital, right? Without this main book, how can you do this? So I, this would be a wrong interpretation. But to end, Marx philosophy, not a speculative philosophy, not mere ideas, always a philosophy that is done for politics, for the political change. And this change is in the end of the working class, self-emancipation of the working class. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your answers. And I think it's uh, very important, all of these uh, remarks. And uh, since the time runs out, maybe we should read out, read out some uh, questions in the chat room. I see that there are two questions, actually. The first one uh, is about the Caudine uh, forks. I think it's a very uh, popular question. So can Caudine Valley, I, I mean, I think uh, he's asking, can Caudine forks be uh, lipped out by the Oriental society in late Marx view? That will be the first, first question. Sorry, this is a question in Chinese or in English? Uh, in English. There are, uh, so you, you, you may, yeah, there are a lot of things in Chinese, but there are advertisements, so just uh, yeah, ignore them. And there is a question posed, raised by Jian Guo, maybe. Can you tell me the time? What time was this question? 10, 12, 10, 12. 10, 12, thank you very much. Oh, can Codin Valley be skipped by the Oriental society in uh, late Marx view? Jingguo, uh, thank you. And then uh, there is more. Can you help me? Yeah, there is uh, another question by, raised by Iris around 10, 19. Okay, I'm reading this. I'm very interested in Marx as a journalist. I don't know if there was any connection between his occupation and the media used the journal and his research, his habit of research. Okay, so she, uh, Iris wants to know more about Marx as a journalist. Okay, uh, should I answer these two questions, may I? Uh, you may be, yeah, uh, yeah, as you prefer, yeah. And uh, I also have uh, a limited time, I can see, because it's already uh, 1053. So I will try to be as short as possible. Yes, it is possible uh, to skip capitalism, according to Marx. And as I was trying to mention before, when Marx is receiving this question uh, from Vera Zasulic, his response is not a rigid response of philosophy or history, like all societies should follow the same stages and class struggles should be always the same. But I want to say that Marx wrote three big drafts of this letter to Vera Zasulic. These drafts are very wonderful, full of very interesting ideas. And this is one of the gems of uh, um, the late Marx. But why Marx only send a short letter, a very short letter to Vera Zasulic? And why Marx in this letter, he said that he was not feeling well and that he could not provide the answer that Vera Zasulic was looking for. And um, by the way, I want to tell you that they wanted to publish Marx's response, but since they did not like Marx's response, they 
did not publish not even the short letter. And uh, this document came out after long time, a couple of decades. So this is very interesting. Sometimes Marx is providing an idea. If you like it, you publish. If you don't like it, then you put it into uh, a box and it will be hidden there. So Marx is perhaps skeptical, in my opinion, about touching such a delicate topic like this one, because uh, he was perhaps not prepared to write in the also the physical condition, health condition that he had on such a, a conflicting uh, issue, um, you know, a final document. So what I'm trying to say is that Marx is, of course, no longer um, convinced that the British working class is doing revolution. There are so many letters in the correspondence between Marx and Engels and also with other people that are disappointed by the fact that the British working class is becoming part of the bourgeoisie. And they are actually, you know, um, instead of doing the revolution, accepting to have, you know, a little bit more of what they had before. And also, I want to say that Marx, the process of Marx learning, this is useful in connection with what we said before, it is not only related to what is reading and what is studying, but is also related to his political activity. For example, Marx has learned a lot with the Paris Commune. And Marx was not convinced that the Paris Commune was a good thing to do because not all the conditions were there. But as Lenin said, if you wait that all the revolutionary conditions are there in order to do the revolution, then you will never start. So in the end, it was a defeat, but at least the Paris Commune demonstrated that the revolution was possible. So Marx is convinced, actually, that the struggle of the populist movement is useful, is interesting, and perhaps this revolution from the periphery is shaking the world and is changing also with another revolution in the center of capitalism that is still Europe at the time. This is the idea of Marx. And um, of course, when Marx is doing this, as I briefly mentioned before, Marx is not doing the mistake of uh, um, you know, believing that the obshina, which means the rural commune in Russia, is the form of socialism, is the form of capitalism, of, so of communism. So Marx knows that this is a, a pre-capitalist organization of agriculture, of, you know, the agricultural production, and this must be changed. The obshina is... Uh, uh, too much archaic and is isolated and there is no communication between the different options and there are many other problems. So the socialism of Marx is a post-capitalist socialism. It's not the socialism of pan-Slavism or, you know, Russia is the center of the world like many revolutionaries, like, for example, like Herzen and also some uh, followers of Bakunin were thinking at the time. The second question, the final question, the one about uh, um, um, uh, journalism, it is very interesting to see what Marx is doing, because as I told you before, we should look at journalism like, you know, a way for Marx to survive. Marx is doing this. Marx is writing for the new American encyclopedia. Marx is writing for the New York Daily Tribune. Marx is writing for the new other side or later in other countries because he needed a job, right? And particularly in those years of extreme poverty, uh, in, during which Marx was suffering a lot. So um, at the same time, we must say that then when Marx is writing about something, he is always rigorous, is very scrupulous. So thanks to Marx's journalism, we have access to his political views of the time. And perhaps this is connected to some question that were asked by Professor Zhang when he was asking about nationalism, when she was asking about, sorry, she was asking about international relations, etc. Because of course we can see how Marx is looking at the main political events of the time, particularly the decade of the 50s, how Marx is looking at the main economical events of the time and how he is, um, taking position in one way or another because he believes that that event, those circumstances can turn history in one direction or another. So without dogmatism, without having a scheme already prepared before that. But let me also say to Iris an interesting things about the Marx and Engels relationship. 
because when he, many times we say Marx and Engels, Marx and Engels, like for example, Engels knew very little of this final studies that Marx did on capital and uh, um, they were not always working together. So there is a lot that we can see in the correspondence, but then the correspondence ended when Engels in the 70s moved to London and is no longer living in Manchester. But actually the journalism is a, a very uh, um, good example of their cooperation, of their collaboration, because actually they had a division of labor and Engels as you might know, it was called the general because it was an expert in military issue, an expert in war. And Engels wrote 40% of these articles published in the New York Daily Tribune, in the New York Tribune. So Engels did this so that Marx could get the money to survive, but at the time also, uh, you know, have enough time to continue his work in his analysis of political economy. And I show you in my chart, that Marx was working very, very hard on the critique of political economy in the 50s. Now we know it. We didn't know it before, but now we have access to the manuscripts of Marx, to the excerpt of Marx. And we can see that he was doing a lot of work and this was only possible, only possible thanks to Engels and thanks to the financial support that he provided for Marx, but also the concrete support that he provided when he was writing articles uh, on his behalf and under his name. Thank you. You have to unmute, Professor uh, Wang. You are muted. I've already unmuted myself. Can you hear me now? Now, yes, yeah. Yeah, I, I said, actually, there's another question, but I don't know if you have time to answer to this question. I would be very, very glad to answer to this question from uh, Ding Wang. I'm gonna, can yeah. you read the question for me or I'll, I'll read it, I'll read it. So questions about the problem of edition of Marx's work. As you pointed out, late Marx work concept has been shifting during his life due to health issues, etc. For a particular concept, even historical materialism has different elaboration during different eras, like 1845, 1859, 1890, through different language version or commodity fetishism based on capital for German translation edition versus the French translation edition in different background contexts, British political economy versus German philosophy versus French socialism. Hence, should Marxists like Marx, as a member of the young Hegelian, analyzing Marx uh, from various periods of refinement or overhaul? Well, if I understand the question correctly, it is a, a problem of edition of Marx work, like uh, how we should look at different edition, how we should look at different texts of uh, Marx, considering that there are several drafts sometimes, several differences in this work. Okay, so if this is the question, I can say that this new edition of the Marx Engels Gesamtos Gabe is very useful, for example, in the second section, because every volume is accompanied by another volume of apparat of, you know, critical notes. And this is guiding the reader to understand what, has Marx, what Marx has done in the making of capital, in the writing of capital, and what are the main changes that he was doing? There are not only changes of rewriting the manuscript, but sometimes there are changes of, you know, concept. Marx understood that this concept was wrong. Marx understood that he had to improve the understanding of that particular topic and aspect, and is making more studies. And uh, this is also true for other. Um, questions like Ding Wang is asking about uh, historical materialism uh, or for example I would like to make an example on communist society like um, I'll end with this because it's already we are already five minutes uh, outside the time like yes historical materialism we cannot consider the formulation of Marx in 1845 like uh, Ding Wang uh, wrote or the famous preface to the critique of political economy of 1859, when Marx is talking about the different modes of production, you know, Asiatic mode of production, slavery, Asiatic mode of production, feudalism, capitalism, socialism, etc., like a rigid scheme. Marx is revising this thing. And Marx is also clearly writing in a response to a review 
of his book, Das Kapital, the Russian edition, another document that Marx did not send to the newspaper, I'm talking about the letter to Mikhailovsky, that Marx did not want to provide an historical scheme that was valid everywhere in the world. So there is a clear help to, um, and you know, a change also improvement in terms of historical materialism that Marx was able to develop thanks to the progress of his studies and then of course, or his analysis, or as I told you, of his historical um, um, political activism, sorry. But let me do the final example of communism. Some people believe that, you know, the idea of post-capitalist society, the idea of communist society in Marx can be found in the German ideology and can be found in the description that we can, you know, socialism is where we have the possibility to, you know, fish in the morning, do the critique in the afternoon and smoke the pipe in the evening. Beside the fact that, you know, less people are smoking the pipe because now we know that it's not very good for your health. I would like to call the attention on the fact that Marx believed that actually socialism, communism is such um, a radical difference compared to capitalism and that you cannot understand this with this utopian formulations. By the way, we know now that this were written by Engels and that Marx is actually making fun of what Engels wrote, uh, all, uh, still following the ideas of Charles Fourier and what uh, Engels used to call um, uh, uh, utopian, uh, utopian socialists. So uh, there are many articles written on the German ideology on the new edition of the German ideology. I don't have the time to go back to this, but I have the time to tell you that if you want to learn Marx ideas about communist societies, the differences with capitalism, you cannot avoid to read the work of political economy, because when Marx is criticizing capitalism, sometimes in his uh, uh, a draft, in his manuscript, at the same time, he's also writing some description of a communist society, how the society should be, what are the main differences with capitalism. So you cannot, once again, only stay with the early writings of Marx, but in order to fully appreciate his analysis, his uh, elaboration is theories. You have to go to the drafts of capitals and also you have to go to the last phase of his life, to the last decade and to the expansion of problematic that he did when he was looking more often, more carefully, more deeply to the periphery of the world and to what we call today the global south. So let me thank you once again for this invitation. And I also want to end my talk with, um, you know, um, congratulations for your social and, and political summer series, because I've seen that you have a very uh, uh, full and busy schedule for the entire month of July, and perhaps even more, with many classes, many interesting things, with many Chinese scholars. I very, very much am looking forward to uh, uh, working with you, returning to uh, Fudan University, to China in person, and uh, of course, to continue the cooperation that uh, we have been doing with the many of you we have been doing for several years. So thank you once again for the invitation and I'm sure that there will be more occasion soon and very hopefully in person. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mesto. I think uh, it's really uh, very late on your side. So we, unfortunately, even we are ready to hear you more, but we have other opportunities, right? We are hoping, looking forward to uh, having you especially in person in Shanghai Fudan University or in uh, Sun Yat-sen University. Uh, Milan will invite you, of course, I think. So thank you again. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, all the audience uh, in on Zoom platform and thank uh, John Milan for having organized the wonderful lecture. And thanks for uh, Song Yifan for technical support. Thank you all. Goodbye.